Hey everyone, how's it going? Vigorous Rapscallion here, just wanted to do another quick tutorial on the chips in Rec Room. Now, I decided I'm just going to do a series where I go over each and every one of these chips in a little bit of detail. And today I'm going to be doing three. I'm going to be doing the variable, the combinator, and the comparer. Now, there's already a really good video that's going to show you a little bit about these. I l put a link to that in the description for this video. If you have a little bit of uh, programming background or if, you know, this sort of thing comes pretty naturally to you, that video is going to give you everything you need to be dangerous. But if this is sort of all Greek to you, uh, you've never done any programming or how to hook up the chips just isn't making sense, things that uh, shouldn't happen are happening, these videos might help you troubleshoot a little bit or if you've never done this before, help you figure out how to make your own games. So let's start out with the simplest chip, the variable. Now with your chips, you've got your outputs on one side, you've got your inputs on the other side. Uh, this one has no inputs, it's just got three nodes on the output side here. Now a useful thing when you're trying to figure out what chips do is to grab the connector tool and you take a look at each of the nodes. So it looks like these all are a possible integer value. So let's take a look at the settings. There's no input, so that's probably where we're going to change them, and there you go. You've got your red signal, your green signal, and your blue signal, and you can make these whatever integer your little heart desires, and uh, that can be positive or negative, so we're going to put in a 4, a 2, and a negative 1 to start with here. Now, this chip is going to do a constant output of whatever value is coming out of the corresponding node. So that's not just going to be a pulse of a 4, that's going to be a continuous 4. And uh, that might not be clear why that's important now, but you're going to see very soon. So of course there's not really a lot we can do with three numbers that can't interact in any way, so let's start making things a little more interesting. Let's throw a combinator chip into the mix. So this is a combinator, it's one of the chips you're going to be using the most often. Um, Let's once again take a look at the nodes to get an idea of what's going on. It looks like we've got possible integer input values here with nothing set by default. And it looks like this output is red plus green. Uh, in this case, that's not exactly true. Uh, we also have the blue node here, which only exists in the addition version of this chip. So, so we can see what's going on. We're going to pull out an output chip. I'm going to stick that just over there so it's in the same field of view. And then we're going to start hooking up some variables. So any output from this combinator over here is going to show up on that little output chip. So let's start by just hooking up two of the variables. Two. So we've got a 4 and a 2 at the top there. A 4 and 2 together is 6. Seems to be working. We've got a negative 1 for our last value. Let's throw that in. Now we've got 2 plus 4 equals 6 plus negative 1 equals 5. That all seems to work well. Now, as I said, the addition one is the only one that's going to have three nodes. You can do a few other mathematical operations using the same chip. Let's take a look at that. So right now it's set to addition, but you can see we've got subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulus. And if you don't know what that is, we're going to demonstrate it in a moment. So let's just stick with these two integers we have going on here, a 4 and a 2, and look at the different operations. Subtraction, sure enough, 4 minus 2 is 2. Multiplication, 4 times 2 is 8. Division, uh, 4 divided by 2 is 2. Now for division, uh, since order of operations does matter, remember that's going to be your first number and that's going to be the number it's divided by. So in this case, 4 divided by 2 is indeed 2. Now let's take a look at modulus. So we're getting a zero with modulus, and that's because what this function does is it divides the two values, the first one by the second, and then if there is a remainder, the remainder is output. If there is not a remainder, a zero is output. So you might be thinking, that sounds pretty freaking useless. Um, what would you ever need that for? But it's actually useful in a lot of different applications. Uh, let's say, for instance, you want something different to happen uh, each time a button is pushed. Let's say, for instance, you want one push to open the door and one push to close the door, and you don't want to have to use two buttons for that system. Well, you can use the modulus uh, with uh, two set as the second number to basically check if something is odd or even. So right now, because four is indeed even, it's outputting a zero. 
let's change our variable here and see what happens. If we change that to a 5, now we're getting a 1. To a 6, we get a 0 again. To a 7, we get a 1 again. 8 is 0 again, so on and so forth. So you can basically use that as a switching gate to change things up every time. If you change your green signal, you can use it to check things less often as a sort of big number checker. So let's say maybe you want to give a player some sort of bonus every uh, every five points or something like that. Then right you'd basically have that trigger when the modulus puts out a zero. So every five points, it's going to put out a zero. Now, you might be wondering, well, how are we going to get things to increment? Because right now, it looks like we have a hardwired variable. We have this little chip that can do a little bit of math. But uh, that's not going to help us increment. So we're going to have to do that using something that pulses. This button over here is going to send out a pulse whenever the button is pressed. But we're going to need to hold that number. And luckily, luckily we can do that uh, very easily using a combinator. Now, I said I was going to get into why the addition combinator is set up a little bit differently. Uh, that's so you can use it to hold a variable. And how you're going to do that is you're going to take your output node here and you're going to loop it back. So each time an integer is put into there, it's going to be added to itself once to the integer that was being held. And let's take a look at that. So now every time I press this button, it should go up by one. Sure enough, it's working. Uh, but let's say you want to increment by, I don't know, pff, 4, 8, or 10 every time somebody scores a point. Let's go ahead and set this back to 4 and 2. Well, that seems pretty intuitive. Let's say I want to increment this by 4 every time now. It seems like I should just be able to connect my 4 from my variable to the blue one here, and then that should do it. But what that's going to do is that's going to give you a runaway integer because that's being constantly fed into this chip and just looping over and over and adding that value over and over to it. If you uh, push the button while this is going, you will add another one onto it, but um, that's kind of beside the point. So how are you going to, say, increment by 5 instead of just increment by 1 each time? It's actually pretty simple to do. All we're going to do is pull up another combinator and we're gonna set this to multiplication there we are and now we're just gonna take this pulse from here and put it into our multiplication function instead and then we're gonna take the value that we want to increment every time in this case a four and we're gonna make that our other variable it doesn't matter which one you make which so Let's connect that up and make sure it works. Now, each time I press this, it should go up by four. And that does appear to be working. All right, so the last chip we're gonna talk about is the comparer chip. And that does exactly what it sounds like. It's gonna compare two values. Let's get it in front of us and take a look. Grab our connector tool. And it looks like we've got a left side and a right side now. It's probably going to correspond to the left side and the right side of the equation. Uh, right now, that doesn't matter because we've got an equals sign in there, but you do have other options. You can do not equals where it also wouldn't matter, or you've got a bunch of uh, less than, greater than, greater than, or equal to, less than, or equal to signs. So you can set it to that. In this case, it doesn't matter what integer you have coming in, but of course, it is going to matter if you have this set to anything besides equal or not equal to. So uh, one simple use for this would be to say, uh, check if somebody has won a game. So you'd want to compare that against a hard set value. So let's say uh, three hits in this game will win, and we know it's four points per hit. So let's make that 12. 12 to win the game. So that's going to be the value that we're comparing against. That's from our green value. And we're going to want to compare that with the integer that's held in our little score chip there. If I can get this one to connect. Then we're going to snag that and compare the two. So we're going to want to look at our output so we can see what's happening with our comparer chip there. So 
let's take a look at each. Okay, so we're getting a zero and we're getting a one. Let's take a closer look at these. Looks like we've got if red equals green or else. So in the case that red equals green, this will be outputting a one. Otherwise, it outputs a zero. In the case that red does not equal green, this will output a one. Otherwise, it will output a zero. So that's a real easy way to keep track of score and end a game after a certain point. Let's make sure it works. And at 12 points, sure enough, we're getting an output signal from there. We can have that trigger our win state for the game, and you're done. Now, you might have noticed all we're getting when the comparison doesn't come out is a 1. Now, we might want to do something else with that, and this chip kind of seems useless because it's basically a smaller version of the selector chip at first glance, but it has a few more advanced options that the selector chip does not have. So let's put it into advanced mode, and we get two little new nodes here, an if signal and an else signal. So basically we get to customize what's going to happen in each of these cases. We get to get a different output. So, uh, for instance, let's say that this isn't a scorekeeper, that this is some sort of logic gate that you want to check a value against a number of comparisons and then have it trigger different ones as it goes. You're probably going to want to keep that value in that case. So, a fun way you can do that is connect that value down to your else case. And look at that. Now, instead of just outputting a 1, we're still retaining our 16. We can keep running that through more logic gates. And uh, in the case that, let me reset this real quick. And in the... Oh, forgot to take the reset off. That's not going to do anything. There we go. And in the case we've won we're getting nothing right now. We have no value set up, so the chip doesn't know what to do. It's not going to default to a 1. You're going to have to put something on that if gate no matter what. So if you just want it to be a 1, that's pretty easy. You can just hook up a 1 to that variable. And look, now we're getting a 1 or you can set it to whatever might be most convenient for your setup. So uh, that's pretty much all you need to know about, select, or about um, comparison chips, combinator chips, and variables. I'm going to be making a video where I set up a quick little game using just these chips, and I'll be posting that later today after I get back from work. So if that sort of demonstration works better for you, you might want to check that out. Thanks again for watching. Uh, have a good day.